Can you hear me now? Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a thrill to be in this session with Eric and Thierry. Um, and I wanted to thank Tim, Boris, Andrea, and Oliver for including me. Um, I come at this uh, from a different perspective of um, let me just yeah good of so I'm a psychophysicist uh, so uh, it's a kind of it's an approach to studying perception and basically what psychophysicists do is we break perception um, and it's the idea of testing until it breaks and by looking at the breaking point to try and make some inference about how it works when it's working properly. Um, and uh, vision scientists, uh, uh, including myself, um, have been interested in uh, reading. Um, and my, so the central part of my research has been how we recognize objects. Um, and in the, uh, attempting to understand how we recognize objects, a lot of the experiments have focused on letters. And along the way, I've learned some things about letters and then a little bit about typography. And at one point, I took a course in type design with uh, Hannes Famira, who is a co-author and part of this, uh, that he gave at uh, Cooper Union. Um, and he said he might be uh, listening to us from Berlin today. Um, and uh, when I took his course, um, started talking and then we started going out to lunch and discovering we were both extremely interested in legibility um, and uh, thinking, you know, this is really great. And then about the third meeting, we discovered that we meant something completely different by legibility. <laughs> um, and, um, and through the course of it, uh, there are other important words like contrast, which again, we had completely different meanings for. And we realized that there really has not been any dialogue between vision science and typography and type design. Um, and we found that very fruitful. And uh, uh, part of the point of my talk today is to share a couple things that we found that we thought were interesting. Um, okay, so here's an outline of what I'm talking about today. So uh, first section, uh, uh, which is what I did with Hannes, uh, is looking at readability um, and the two interpretations that the two fields have. Uh, and, uh, and I'll show you a competition that he and I ran. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, basic measures of vision that apply to seeing letters, uh, acuity, contrastivity, um, some interesting things about size that have been, uh, I think, sort of discovered independently by the two fields. Uh, and then finally, I want to explain uh, a really important topic in uh, object recognition, which is a very basic limit in our reading, which is crowding. And I'll touch on it briefly at the beginning, but uh, hit it harder at the end. Um, okay, readability. So, Hannes and I both thought legibility cool, and, and uh, it turns out that for a vision scientist, legibility is reading speed, um, uh, perhaps with a footnote about comprehension. Um, and that for Hannes, as a type designer, readability was something closer to comfort. Um, uh, not quite beauty, because that seems too pretentious, but comfort has this quality of enjoying the reading of it. Uh, it has to do with pleasure. Um, and uh, I was quite surprised by that. He was quite surprised that I gave so much attention to speed because that seemed to him rather secondary. Um, and um, so anyway, so we talked about it. And uh, here's, uh, I, uh, I was hanging out in a uh, typo file at the time. Here's a quote. Uh, this is a typographer talking about, I'm all for science in its place. We can investigate how reading works, but readability is not and never will be a scientific concept. Designers have tried to reduce type design to mathematical principle for centuries, but it never works. Um, so that's sort of uh, not very hopeful. Um, and then this is a colleague of mine who I have a great respect for. And we were sitting around having drinks after I had given a talk about type to my vision colleagues. And he was saying in a slightly dismissive tone, as a vision scientist, I would like to understand legibility, but surely that understanding must come from the study of people reading. The aesthetic views of type designers seem irrelevant. They are an elite group, and I'm sure their aesthetic reactions are different from mine. So what possible relevance could their opinions have to how I read? More generally, the concern for aesthetics and appearance seems to be at best tangential to understanding reading. I read novels for content. I don't care about the font or the layout. 
the typography does not affect my pleasure in reading, nor my choice of which book to buy. Anyway, all the publishers I know say otherwise. Um, so there we are. Um, so the point is, is that uh, uh, people who are well-versed in each of the fields have uh, quite different views on this issue of readability. Um, so uh, Thierry was saying some things about how we read, and um, what I'm saying is parallel to that. Um, it turns out that one of the things that is quite stable about reading across people who read quickly and slowly is that you get about four movements per second. Um, so this is uh, some measurements of Huey in 1900. It was the first time that people can measure it carefully. Um, and these are the fixations that someone is making as they're uh, reading a page. Um, and, uh, and the difference in people who read slowly and quickly um, is the visual span, how far apart those fixations are. Uh, so again, I'm repeating what Terry was telling me. Um, and, but even though that's in the context of reading, the way we scan the real world is rather similar. Again, it's something like for four eye movements per second, and we scan. This is a, a, a Hoku size a great wave. Um, okay. So what's your visual span? So you can try it here. Um, you can fixate your eye on the middle, and without moving your eyes, how many letters can you pick up? That's the definition of visual span. Um, and uh, I can usually get something like crowd. Uh, I had a, a student I used to work with who could get up, get all the way up to uncrowded, which is nine characters, and you might be somewhere in that range. Um, and uh, Thierry pointed out that uh, contrast can affect that. Um, but uh, what we showed in our research, uh, not but, and, um, is that crowding, um, uh, that while you're fixating here, uh, the letters up here, you can tell that they're there, but they're somehow jumbled. And that jumbling is the process called crowding, which I'll come back and hit harder at the end of my talk. Um, here is uh, an illustration of the idea that in your center of vision, um, you see clearly, um, and you can make up the letters. And uh, beyond a certain point, the letters are all crowded um, and jumbled. And these are letters that have been substituted to be equivalent under crowded conditions. Um, and uh, so if you look at them directly, well, it's just terrible. Um, but if you fixate your eye here, I think you'll agree with me that the whole page seems to be just perfect. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and the defects that are out here aren't uh, something you can pick up on. And so the notion is that that's the way we read. We pick up one uncrowded window at a time. Um, that's, that's your visual span. Um, OK. So that's speed then. So speed is going to be the product of four letters per second times the width of your uncrowded window. And uh, one of the things that would predict, because crowding turns out to be scale invariant, um, is that reading speed should be size invariant. Um, and these are some measurements I made with a colleague uh, some time ago, um, and uh, showing a very wide plateau of reading speed. So vertical scale is reading speed in words per minute. This is size covering a huge range this is about 1,000 to 1. Um, and as you see, something like 100 to 1 range, the reading speed varies very little. OK. Um, so this issue of what is the best font has an old history. Um, and roughly every 50 years, some government appoints a blue ribbon committee of scientists to look into it and choose and make a recommendation on what is the best font. Um, so one important one was done in England. And this was a report written by Richard Pike, which I thought was quite well done. Um, and uh, in, in the official report, uh, they say, the hypothesis here is put forward that extremely large typographical differences must be present before it is possible to say that there is any difference in the objective legibility of type. Of types more slightly differentiated, it's impossible to say that one is objectively more legible than another. So that's a slightly long-winded way of saying, it's very clear, um, is that Everyone views these things as basically a, a horse race, uh, and there's going to be the excitement of then declaring one winner. And every time this horse race is run, it always comes out to be a dead heat, uh, which is not very exciting. Um, and, uh, and Pike's result was, was typical. Um, this is uh, uh, a uh, uh, typ typographic book, A Short History of the Printed Word Chapel. Um, it says, Futura is the most successful of the Sanseros types. Um, and he, well, anyway, he's taking views on different types. I'm going to have a little bit about time. Um, okay, I'm going to skip that too. 
Okay, so um, Hannes and I were feeling that, okay, it's fine to compare speeds. We understand that the speed competitions have been disappointing because they don't seem to show much difference between um, the available, commercially available fonts. Um, but, you know, there's more to uh, uh, legibility than speed. You know, what about comfort? Um, and so he and I decided to design a trial together. Uh, so first we tried to pick out a wide range of uh, available type, uh, sort of some in the text category meant for typesetting books, um, and some in a display category that are all over the place. Um, and uh, Beowulf, I think, is here. Um, and, um, uh, and then we thought, we're not going to just measure speed, we're also going to measure pleasure. So we uh, typeset uh, one page in each of the, of the fonts and had our observers read a page. And after reading, so we measured how long they took. We did a, a minor comprehension test, which I'm not reporting. Um, and um, we also had them rate the pleasure of reading it. Um, and the results we got were fun. Um, so the vertical scale is speed. Uh, the horizontal scale is pleasure. This is the number they gave. Um, and it could be positive pleasure or negative pleasure. Um, and each point is one observer reading one text. Uh, and the, let's see, I've forgotten the names of the fonts. This is a poppy font. This is um, uh, Black Sabbath. That's Kunzler. Uh, and Hannes was quite pleased because I did all the trials back in New York, uh, but this is his, his uh, Interpol, uh, Serif and Sans Serif, um, uh, which came out at the, uh, the highest end of pleasure and of uh, speed. However, um, uh, we don't have standard errors plotted here. The standard errors are larger, so that, in fact, uh, as far as speed is concerned, in this high end, oh, I, one very important thing is the black symbols are the text fonts uh, and the blue symbols are the display fonts. So if you look at the text fonts, they do vary in pleasure, but they basically don't vary in speed. They're all up here. Um, and so we are replicating this old finding of a dead heat. There isn't much to choose about speed between the fonts. Um, but we're getting this extra dimension of pleasure, finding there's a huge range of pleasure. Um, the uh, text fonts basically go from zero to positive. The display fonts go basically into ugliness. Um, and to get the, the you, you don't get the really big drops in speed until you get to the really ugly fonts. So these are type designers who quite intentionally making things that are hard to read um, and violating the normal rules of letter shape. Uh, so Kunzler is this very fancy display script, and they were reading capitals, which are the elaborate ones, uh, which I think are basically designed for creating things like wedding invitations and invitations to a funeral, where you want to, to force the reader to read very slowly. So it gives gravity to make it hard to read. Um, and uh, the Black Sabbath is their, their damaged forms that, again, make it hard to read. And it's sort of intriguing. Um, so. Uh, anyway, so that was what we found trying to put in, uh, each of us putting in our two cents and how to score fonts. Okay. Um, I want to just tell you some things that come out of vision science, sometimes a parallel in um, um, type design. Um, so uh, Eric measured, mentioned this, uh, uh, the Dutchman uh, Snellen. This is the uh, 19, this is one of his original eye charts. I had it lent to me for a show we did a few years ago. Um, and um, so this acuity measures the smallest letter that you can see. And that was introduced uh, to uh, prescribe glasses, uh, uh, which is the optics, which uh, uh, Eric talked about. And optimizing your, your optics by wearing glasses is a very important thing to do. And the modern eye chart is really hardly changed from what Snell and introduced in 1866. Um, in vision science, uh, acuity remains of the importance that it has had, always had. Um, but we also know about other dimensions. So this is an eye chart that a colleague and I introduced, which this is called the Pelly robson contrast sensitivity chart. And as you see, the letters um, uh, remain, uh, start out big and black like an acuity chart but they remain the same large size and they fade to lighter and lighter 
shades of gray until they disappear. So the faintest contrast that you can see is our measure. Um, this is uh, an image that was introduced by Calvin Robson, which allows you to examine the human observer sensitivity um, over a range of spatial frequency, the same way that in, ta in hearing you can go from, from high tones to low tones um, and measure your sensitivity at each, and that's called an audiogram. Uh, in vision, we can go from coarse to fine and measure your contrast sensitivity at each frequency. And that has turned out to be very important in vision science. Um, and this is an equalizer of a kind that students used to have in their dorm rooms. Um, and now you only ever see uh, simulations of it on a screen. Uh, it's not a, a, a box of aluminum anymore. Um, but anyway, you have knobs to adjust the gain at each of the audio frequencies. You can do the same in, in vision. Um, and uh, this is uh, an antecedent to uh, the equalizers that students have. These are called Helmholtz resonators. Um, and uh, Helmholtz uh, was interested in the harmonic structure of music, and he created these uh, brass spheres. The small end you stick in your ear, and the big end lets the music come in, and it emphasizes one of the frequencies as a way of showing, uh, allowing musicians to learn what the overtones are, what they sound like alone. Um, so this is a study we did in vision. This came out on the cover of Nature uh, uh, in 94, um, where we showed that the visual system, when it sees letters, is actually picking up only a band of frequencies. Um, so on here, you see a bunch of letters that you're meant to read. Uh, but superimposed on the letters uh, is some noise. So the letters are at high contrast, and they fade down independently each column. And then the noise is this stuff. And it's white noise that was filtered to a band. So each of these bands is a different frequency. And all the bands have the same power. And then you can see uh, which band interferes most with your reading. Um, and it's probably something like one of the middle ones. And so how far, how effective the noise is, is measured by your threshold. And so how far you can read down. So I would have to just be guessing because I'm way too close. Um, but um, you'll find that noise is most effective in the middle and less effective here. So in the edges, you may be able to read all the way down because the noise doesn't interfere um, for the uh, very fine noise and very coarse noise, but the middle noise. Um, and so this indicates, and in, uh, quite a detailed analysis shows, that you can interpret all of the results as that the mechanism that we use to identify letters, that is to say the mechanism in your eye to identify letters, um, has a sensitivity to frequency that wanes at high and low frequency and is, a t is tuned, it's a channel, much like the channels we use to hear a pure tone in music. Um, so that was for letters, uh, but you know, who cares about how we see letters? What we're interested in is reading, uh, and this shows a parallel result for reading. Um, is Sue here? Sue, would you mind reading for me the whole chart? Okay, fine. So she's skipping this and then here. Very good. Okay, so the point is that um, these are, it's the same kind of chart as before, but now instead of having a single letter, I had text, which Sue was reading for you. I forgot to warn you I was going to do that. Thank you. Um, and, um, and what you saw was that when the noise frequency was away from the channel, it interfered very little. As it got close, she slowed down and here, it abolished her ability to read. Um, so the channels that were revealed for identifying letters also apply to reading. Um, OK, so now I want to show you a demo, partly because it's cool, partly because it shows something interesting about reading. Um, so this is the idea of scale invariance. So um, one of the most obvious things about letters and reading is that size doesn't matter. Um, except, of course, a few type designers know better. Um, and Eric was reminding us of that. Um, but this is a, a special image that was created uh, based on the ideas that I was just showing you, um, that, that an image is made up of many frequencies. Um, so what we did is we took an A, and then we filtered it to keep only the lowest octave, the very coarse frequencies. And then we took a B and kept the next octave, and a C and the next octave, 
and then we added them all together. And uh, so perhaps, I don't know, the F is, is most visible. It'll depend. And uh, how about in the front row? F, okay, fine. Um, and um, so that's fine. So it's a weird way of making an image, but you all see it as an F, fine. Um, so now let's make it smaller. So if, if the way we recognize things didn't depend on scale, then making it smaller should make no difference. So can we have the back row say? What, do you, what letter do you see? Okay. Someone with very sharp eyes might get a C at the end. But, um, and so this is showing that, in fact, we analyze letters differently at different scales, um, which um, uh, Eric alluded to in the context of uh, optical design. Is that the phrase? Um, here is another version of it. Uh, this is uh, a famous painting by the painter Chuck Close. Um, and I wrote an article about it, but he got the painting on the cover of Science. Um, and so this is his daughter, Maggie. Uh, uh, this is big, and the, the real painting is actually about this big. Um, and if you're standing re relatively close, then there's this blocky image. You can sort of tell it's a young woman, but she has problems because she doesn't have a nose. Um, and then there's this stain, like she has skin cream on. And then she has like bruises between her eyes and the sides of her nose. Um, and then if you just walk away from it, um, suddenly um, her nose pops out and you realize her skin is just fine. And those are just shadows. Um, and she's a healthy old woman. Um, and the only difference is size or uh, in the painting, you just walk away. So it's viewing angle, but it's a visual size is changing. Um, and we studied that and showed that, in fact, you're perceiving differently at different size. Um, and in type design, this of course has been known for a long time. Uh, so this is uh, John Downer's uh, paperback font. Um, so this is uh, the letter forms that you get using his font at 96 point. And here is the letter size the forms you get at nine point, which are visually a reasonable match across size. And yet physically they're not. Um, so if you take the nine point and blow it up, this is what you would get. And if you take the, the 96 point and shrink it, that's what you would get, which seemed like less poor matches. Um, and so this is essentially the, uh, I was giving you the vision scientist perspective. Uh, and here is the type designer's perspective on the same issue, is that vision actually uh, is not quite scale invariant. Um, and that um, if you look carefully, you can sh uh, discover the ways in which vision changes with scale. Okay, so um, I've covered all of, the things on my agenda except the last, which is crowding. Uh, crowding is turning out to be a very, very important thing. We're, uh, many of us in vision science uh, and object creation think it's a window into understanding how we recognize objects. It also is a, a very severe and important limitation how fast we read because it determines the width of the visual span. Um, so firstly, what is crowding? Well, crowding is when an ob you fail to recognize an object because of clutter around it. Um, and it's not an obvious thing to pick up because there is hardly any crowding in your central vision and it becomes progressively worse as you go more and more on the periphery. So anything you look at directly doesn't suffer from crowding unless you belong to a couple of clinical categories. Strabismic amblyops have crowding in their central vision and apperceptive agnosics do. Um, anyway, so if you fixate here, um, and you, I ask you what's in the left of your visual field, but while you keep your eye here, you can tell that there's a single letter up there. And in fact, it's just an R, quite obviously. Um, and while you keep your eye there, I can ask you what's in your right visual field. And I say, okay, there's three letters, but I just want to know the middle one. Um, and you can tell that, well, there's about three letters there. You might be able to guess what the first and last letter are. Um, but if you're like me, I think you'll discover that the middle letter is just, you can't, you would just have to be wildly guessing what it is. Um, and uh, so fine, so well, what's wrong with you? Well, if we ask you to swing your eye over here and look directly, well, it's an R, of course, uh, and you can look at the green plus and, and you can completely tell that there's an R there, it's no problem. Uh, but if you go back to the red minus, then it, you fail again. Um, and so that's just demonstrating that in your periphery, uh, an object becomes unrecognizable when it's surrounded by clutter. Here's another version of it, um, that 
it's a bunch of sticks just cluttered, uh, but among the sticks, there's obviously an A. Um, and you can look at it directly, you can see an A, you can look at here, and there's an A there, no problem. Duh. Uh, and you swing your eye out here, and the A will persist for a little bit, and then it will go away, and it's just gone, and there's just sticks out there. There's no A. And you can repair your eye by bringing here, and then you can see the A, and you come back here, and the A will persist, and it'll go away, and there's no A. And that's crowding. Um, and the theory we have, um, uh, so there's some parts of crowding that are controversial, but what I'm going to say now is not controversial, is that um, it basically seems to be hard to recognize things. And to do it, the visual system has to cut out just the relevant features, not too much junk, um, and then recognize that. And so when the visual system can cut this out, then it correctly identifies it as an A. And when you're uh, here, you do so. You can, uh, the visual system can combine over just that area. When you're out here, the minimum region it can combine is too big, and it gets the A and the chaff, and it fails, just a jumble. And uh, one can make measurements of those combining fields. Um, and uh, so if the observer is fixating here, the experiment is you show a target letter, and you put flankers around it. And then you vary the spacing of the flankers until they can just get it. And th this green line traces what that would be. And then you can do it again uh, for a target that's here. And then the different colors show what happens if you change the letter size. Let's, I forgot, I think it's factors of two letter size. Uh, so you can do it with a, a half size N or a twice big N. And what you see is you get exactly the same circle. So it doesn't matter how big the letters are. Um, in fact, a lot of things don't matter. Uh, you get this spacing that depends simply where you are in the visual field. And these are big spacings to, that you need in order to avoid crowding. Um, it affects a lot of things. Turns out that I was showing you crowding for a word, and since there was the A-R-E, that was a word. Um, and uh, so you could ask, well, what's a face like? Is a face like a letter that you can just see a single one out in the periphery, or is a face like a word that crowds itself? Turns out a face is like a word. So if you look at these guys, they're familiar, the former governor and the king. Um, and, uh, but if you fixate here, um, I think you'll agree that it's just sort of the so if there's two guys in suits, they're quite anonymous. Um, you can't recognize them. Uh, here's a Picasso. So uh, some of um, Picasso's Cubist paintings uh, seem to be um, uh, exploring ideas related to crowding. Um, so this is uh, Nu Chelward, who is a trapeze artist. He did several paintings of her. Um, and if you look at her directly, um, well, it's really a monstrous face. Uh, one important detail is that her nose is not between her eyes. Um, and yet, if you uh, fixate here, um, one of the things about crowding when it jumbles things is it can't tell you where the features are. They all lose their location. Um, and I think you might find that she's still bluish, um, but her face seems quite natural and quite pretty. She has the, the curly hair, the, the eyes, all, the, all the, the right features are there and the, the positional errors are not obvious. Um, here's another. So in this one, it's more fun, I think, if you see it in peripherally first. Um, so I'm asking you to fixate there. And once you're all fixating there, is everyone ready? I'm going to switch it and try and keep your eye on the plus and then judge the image from that vantage point. Here you go. Um, so it's a drawing. Um, and there's a, basically an elegant, oddly dressed young woman uh, leaning back in a heavy chair. Um, and then when you look at her, you discover that, oh my God, uh, she has problems. Um, okay, so that's crowding. Here's another version of crowding. Uh, these, uh, uh, there are, neurologists use a copying task to test neurology patients. And the, this is the Ray diagram introduced by an important French neurologist in 1920, I think, uh, called uh, Ray. And so the Ray diagram, and so you give them this, you ask them to copy it, and you get copies that look sort of like this. The only thing, though, is that these copies weren't produced by patients, they were produced by normal graduate students. Um, and um, that they had the special instructions that they had to fixate on this plus um, and never move their eyes from here. So they only saw this in the corner of their eye, and they only saw what they were drawing in the corner of their eye, and they produced these copies. We gave them to a neurologist to evaluate, and he said, in fact, they would pass for patients with brain damage, they're called aphroceptive agnosics. Um, and so it indicates that 
the way we see in our periphery is like the way some people see when they have brain damage. Um, okay, so I'm going to just end now. Uh, this is just a summary of crowding, um, showing that this critical spacing, I commented that critical spacing is the same for small or large letters. It's also the same for uh, every simple object. So these little grading patterns that vision scientists are very fond of, letters, these are silhouettes of animals, these are signs designed by the Department of, uh, there was a committee appointed by the Department of Transport. They, these are the standard bathroom signs and symbols. Uh, furniture, fast food. Um, so what I'm showing here is critical spacing. So if you look at these guys, they're easy to identify. Uh, if you look here, you probably can tell what the middle uh, uh, item is. If you look out here, you fail, they're crowded. Um, and some of you will have more crowding than others. You can vary where you fixate along here. You can probably find a place where you can just barely identify the middle. And, um, and what you discover is the size doesn't matter, and you get the same critical spacing for all these different objects. Those are simple objects, and here are complex objects. So a house has parts, and it turns out the parts of a house can uh, interact. The same with the word, and the same with the face. So this is Mahatma Gandhi. Um, and if you look at him directly, of course, you can recognize him. Um, and if you look out here, it's a sort of a brown face with glasses uh, and about on the ear. And this applies to all faces that if, for example, me, so many of you are beating me for the first time. If you look at my nose, perhaps I'm familiar. Um, but if you look out to my shoulder, I'm just a guy with glasses. Um, so anyway, uh, I'd like to end there and uh, just... I talked about readability, it's um, legibility is a concept that's very important in type design and in vision science, and we have basically met quite different things for, uh, about it, and Hannes and I showed some data showing that, uh, uh, something about the relation of the two parameters. Um, uh, we, I talked about the measures that vision scientists use, acuity, contrast sensitivity, um, which are this, this uh, method of pushing the system until it breaks and uh, using that breaking point as an index to how the system works. Um, and talked about size, where it, it turns out in the end that vision is not size invariant and vision scientists and type designers have discovered it in different ways. Um, and finally, I gave you some insight into crowding, which determines the uncrowded window, which determines your visual span, which determines how fast you can read. Um, thank you very much.